Hello, a very nice and warm welcome and good afternoon to everyone here, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our parallel session for day two APEC Ghana uh, meeting. So we are pressed for time. We are going to still make sure we make very good use of our time and learn the most that we can out of the session. So my name is Hannah Brown Amwaku. I work with the sports team. I'll keep it simple like that. So today we're going to do something wonderful. How many of us know this wonderful woman I have here? Raise my hand if you know her. Hey, Munti Nihon Fama. Sir. Someone raise their hand at the back. Tell me what you know about her. Who is she? Okay, so I know she's Dr. Sylvia Ayele Diganu. I worked with her at Tema General Hospital. I was there for about six, seven years before I left there. I also know she's very passionate about maternal health. I know she does a few things with WHO and the public health school in Legon. Yes, but most importantly, she is very passionate about maternal health. Yes. Thank you very much. I think she summarized the introduction, so I don't need to say anything anymore. So I looked up your profile on LinkedIn and some other website. I was like, okay, I can't even begin to start. But we have someone with wonderful OBGY expertise, and she's going to really break things down to us to help us. I think you have feedback, so I should go this way. To help us understand our topic for today. So you're not in the wrong place. So our topic for our session is strengthening the quality of practice in antenatal and postnatal care services to improve outcomes of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Key learnings. You see, when you have someone who has so much experience, the person comes to you with practical examples. So I'll tell you what she has in store for us even before I give um, um, the, the mic to her. She came fully prepared. We have case studies. We are going to analyze the case studies. We are going to answer questions based on our experiences, the lessons we have learned over the period of time. And then encourage each other, learn something from it, so that when we go back to our respective institutions, we can indeed improve care for our pregnant women. So without much ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Sylvia Diganus to take it for us. Thank you. Um, thank you for the kind words. You know, when you hear from your house officers, sometimes you are scared about what they say. Because sometimes they think you are too strong or you are too correct. But I, I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Actually, my mentor is right here. Um, I worked with uh, Dr. Audrey for many years as a young doctor. And every time I see him around me, I feel encouraged. So I want you to think of the future and how you too will be mentoring other people in a few years to come. So. These are three generations of people who have learned from each other. I can tell you what I pass on to you, a lot I learned from my mentor here. Thank you. So my topic today is strengthening the quality of practice of antenatal and postnatal care services to improve outcomes for women with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Next slide. To handle this section, when I was asked to look at the topic. I thought a bit about how I was going to do that and whether to just come and talk or engage the participants here. And I thought the best way to deal with this problem is to engage you all. So I'll just start with a bit of introduction and to highlight some of the challenges that women face in our health services. We're all going to do a group work. I have four cases you are going to discuss. And when you discuss those cases, you will point out those key challenges that we all face. And then we will all come up with solutions about how we are going to overcome that to strengthen our health system. And I hope that this will send the message across. So please, you are going to do a lot more talking than I will be doing. So get yourselves ready. Um, 
So just to highlight the problems, next slide please. Um, a lot have been said about hypertension in pregnancy. We all have heard today about all the risk factors. They've been talked out at length. And so the question we've asked and we are asked to answer today is why are women still dying? We know the risk factors. We know the treatments. We've been told so many times about what works. And so I'm hoping, like I said, that through these case studies, we are going to answer why women are still dying and how do we prevent our women from dying? What can we do immediately in the long term to stop our women dying from the hypertensive? Because it's preventable. We can't prevent the hypertension, but we can, to a large extent, prevent women from dying and from suffering its severe consequences, at least in today's world. So I counted the number of us here today. We are roughly about 1920. So I'm going to divide us into five groups each. And we, you don't have to move. So the first five in this session will be given a case to look at. And I think we will give case, group, um, case study one to those here. You will be giving two to another five in the middle, three to the remaining five here. Just turn your chairs around. Just form a little small circle. Group three is here. Two is in the middle and group four will be which one do you have? Case three. So case study four will be at the end. Those at the end. Please hear. Case one is here. Case two is here. Case three is here. And case four is here. So case four, please give it to them. Because of time constraints, you have only 10 minutes to discuss these cases. We are going to give you 15 minutes, 15 minutes to talk about your cases. But we are going to give you 10 minutes because we know you've had a lot and today is Friday, traffic is an issue. Now, what are you supposed to do? Read these cases and identify the challenges in this. Why did that woman have the poor outcome that was listed and what could have been done differently because when we determine what done differently that we will change things so please you have a task to, to solve so I would ask that each group come up with somebody to speak for them can we have each group identify one speaker? Okay. And we are here to clarify if there's anything you don't really understand. So. We are told they are from people of online. So I'm going to put up the case studies and they can read it. So we'll put it up for about five minutes. Read the case study, put down your points so that you can also contribute to the discussion. So please, the next slide after the introduction. So leave this case study on for about five minutes. Then we'll, you'll move to the next one. So those online, please also participate.
Okay, so shall we round up our group discussions and come back into a plenary together? It's are still buried. Look <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'll give you one more minute. Please round up so we can discuss together. Okay, let's all come back together. <laughs> let's come back together. We have four groups, and I think we'll start with group one. Let's turn around. No, this is group. You are group two, three, and four. Can I see us all turning in this direction to look at the screen, please? Mm -hmm. We will. <laughs> and beyond. But for now, let's get together, please. Shall we have the representative from Group 1? Let's start clapping. So good afternoon once again. So we are group one members and we had a very interesting scenario. And our questions were, the first one, what were the barriers that contributed to the poor outcome of Araba, Arabes pregnancy? So we came out with these deliberations. Barriers. So we have the first point to be socio demographic barriers. The first one being the age. We could see from the projected scenario that Araba was 17 years of age. At that age, teenagers are so novice about so many things, don't know much about even pregnancy and what it is being associated with. She was also unemployed, not working. Couldn't so somebody who is not working probably will not 
be able to find herself a nutrition aspect in even going to the ANC because of late we have the national health insurance but when you get there you have to really pay for most of the services she's single support there is no spouse so probably she will really be going through some emotional she needs some emotional support again family support from the scenario we realized that the family were not too happy about a condition so meaning family support also was not available the pregnancy also was on unplanned it's not a planned pregnancy so as it's not planned it, it will have its associated implications again she was ignorant of the pregnancy because when the midwife told her that she was having hypertension she was just thinking aloud asking herself as a teenager where from how will i get how will i be a hypertensive patient so she was ignorant of the pregnancy and what's the pregnancy or the complications of the pregnancy again stigma so all these points came from our deliberation it came under the socio demographic barriers and then the next question was then we also have a clinical the clinical barriers so the clinical barriers the first point we have delayed reporting at the ANC, the ANC. she's pregnant a teenager but her booking visit was the, during the fifth month so you could see that she came in late and then patient did not see or understand the seriousness of her condition, ignorance. When she was being told of her condition, she was doubting. Again, patients might not have been adequately informed of the condition. Yes, one thing that we also realized from the scenario, the midwife just told her you are having hypertension without really educating the client or coming, using terms or explaining for her, to her understanding. So quickly, the client jumped into a con uh, conclusion that what is hypertension at all? And because of that, she defaulted. The midwife told her the next day she should come and see the doctor. Because of that, she didn't come. Another clinical barrier, delay in further management when diagnosis was made. A BP of 150.95 millimeter per mercury with protein rear of two pluses. The midwife told her to go to the house and come back tomorrow to come and see the doctor without as a midwife with all the empowerment and all that we've learned at least giving she should have given first aid like giving any antihypertensive nothing was given but just she should go and come back tomorrow so there there is delay in further management again referral process took too long and then had been in the clinic again from the scenario she came in the morning she spent the whole day at the facility just to be attended to and later when she was told to come back tomorrow to come and see the doctor so these are our barriers now the solutions the solutions we started from the preventive measures from the broader view so all adolescents they need abstinence Yes, because they are unemployed. They are really not ready for this pregnancy thing. So they really have to abstain. Again, adolescent sex education at our various schools so that they will be empowered as teenagers to take the right decision. And even if they get pregnant, to be informed about the decisions that they take. Solutions are the ANC. The midwife should have admitted the case yes looking at because it's having so many red flags not telling her to go home and again at the hospital the waiting time was too long so we should have to see to address that also again we need adolescent friendly environment she came in the midst of all her mothers at the ANC at least we should have separate days for them midwife should also have done follow-up the client defaulted when she was being asked to come the next day to come and see the doctor so the midwife could have linked up with the community health nurses so that they follow up on the clients. Again, midwife should spend more time educating on the condition. The client didn't really understand her condition. And then the last point, emergency management should, be, should have been provided by the midwife. So these are a few points that we came out from our deliberations. Thank you. Um, anybody wants to add one or two things? We don't have time.
that you also have observed. Whilst the second group, group two, come to the floor. Anything else? Yes, please go ahead. For some time now, I've realized that for my pregnant women, when I tell them what could happen to the baby, I, you know, they change their perception about, okay. and then in fact they decide to now come because the baby is why they are pregnant. Well, that's why they got pregnant okay. anyway. Okay. So when I tell them that these are the things that could happen, this is your case. Now the default rates, you know, it goes down. down. Okay. Thank you. Any other pressing question? Do we have any hand raised among the online participants, please? Yes, online participants. Do you have any comments to add on? Nothing for now? Okay. So please post your questions. Um, if you are online or if you want to speak, you raise your hand, we'll get to you. Thank you very much, Group 1. Let's give it up for them again. <laughs> group 2, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. Please, can we have our case um, so our audience can look at it? Um, so we are looking at a case where um, the woman has been pregnant for the fifth time, but had a successful uh, uh, four pregnancies and deliveries. But this time, she reported with high blood pressure. And um, we saw in the scenario that um, treatment was initiated by the health provider but uh, the client failed to comply. And so the outcome was that we had uh, a very bad case at the, at the end of it. So we want to look at what went wrong. So the barriers, we, we answered the questions concerning the barriers, barriers that contributed to the poor outcome. First of all, we, we have established that the health provider didn't do well at the initial stage of seeing this client, uh, knowing well that a woman who has had uh, four successful pregnancies and deliveries uh, might not see it very significant at the fifth time when she reported with hypertension. And so anything you are telling this woman who has had normal pregnancy and deliveries, you, ha you have to do a lot of effort to convince her. So in the initial stages, we, we established that the, the, the provider failed to establish rapport and good communication with this client to, under to explain to this client the, the condition, the, what the, the new development with the fifth pregnancy and the, the, the outcome that may come if it is not well managed. And so once the communication and the rapport was poor from the beginning, the, the provider went ahead to give a treatment which the client could not afford. So we saw that uh, medications were prescribed but the patient could not afford. So these medications were not taken meticulously and so the high blood pressure was not um, uh, well controlled. And so she kept coming, and this thing, this uh, episode continued. Uh, she was not complying with the treatment because treatment was very expensive. And so we see that the uh, condition kept deteriorating over the period. And finally, uh, when the, the provider made a decision that this woman has to go on admission because we saw that she reported at the time with um, BP of 180, 110. And so at this time, uh, Provera saw that no, this woman has to uh, be admitted. But at this stage also, she failed to comply because everything that started from the beginning was not done properly. Uh, and also we saw that the, they failed to follow up on this case because when the woman came with, uh, at a point we saw 170, that is very high. And so they will have initiated some follow-up mechanism, try to establish the support uh, system around this woman so they can take good care of her, but they fail to do that. We also look at the, uh, the maternal aspect, barriers from maternal aspect. So we saw uh, maternal age is also a factor here. Uh, 44, uh, this is a high-risk group, and also the 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 number of times she'll be pregnant. So already she's a high risk for the condition. Uh, she also reported somehow late, and then we saw non-compliance on her part. She, she failed to comply to any treatment 
but also we all, though we blame it on the provider, we saw that she was not compliant to any treatment that was offered. We also saw financial barrier. Uh, if she's able to afford her medications, even if it is expensive, she's able to, uh, to buy it. But because she was not having the financial muscle to buy her medications, she couldn't. So we want to uh, look at the solution. So uh, we know fundamentally as providers, the first contact that we had with our clients is very important. So we try to establish with them the, the treatment, telling them what the condition is. Let them know every pregnancy is unique, so anything can happen. So at this stage, we realized that if we had established good rapport and good communication, that the woman is able to understand her current situation, uh, she would have uh, complied or yeah, followed the treatment guideline. So we didn't do that. So I, it's very good for us. Yesterday, I noticed that uh, one of the facilitators said her experience with preeclampsia, when she was admitted, she never knew of her condition until when the doctors came around and they were referring to her as the woman with severe preeclampsia. That was when she was able to know that, ah, this was a situation. So very important, we need to uh, teach our clients from the beginning what we are treating so they can comply. Then also follow up. I think that with all that we have heard about preeclampsia now, that we know is killing our mothers, any woman who we have diagnosed of preeclampsia, we should put in place proper follow-up mechanisms. One, even if it is one, let's do everything that is possible. So we follow up on this client. So we, we follow her to delivery that she can have safe delivery. Then also, um, let us also try to identify the family support system around every woman who come with this condition. So we can mobilize family support or community support to support our women who come with preeclampsia so they can have successful delivery. Thank you. Thank you, group two. Excellent um, analysis. Um, there are a few questions whilst group three is getting ready. I can see some hands are up. So. No, no, you can. Is it a question or a contribution? Group three is true. Yeah, yes. So, the Asteni mentioned that there was a challenge of not being able to purchase all the drugs that were prescribed to her. And then she wasn't telling the health workers this challenge. Um, what could they have done differently if they knew? I just want to know that, if you could speak to that, what could the doctors have done? So um, she couldn't prescribe the drugs that, because they were expensive. Yeah, she didn't buy because they were expensive. We all know that although we may have, let's say, nephedepen um, prescribed, there are brands of it. For all you know, the pharmacy where she went to has the expensive brand. So, another, um, let me say another version of it, which is less cheaper, can be prescribed for the patient to get it. Other than that, there are instances that there are some emergency ones that can be given out in some facilities so that you now look at how you bring in the social welfare department and see how best they can help you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you have an... The support system could have helped if other persons were brought on board. Thank you. So Thank you very much. Let's clap for group two. Nicely done. Hello everyone. My name is Efia Sechi and I'll be presenting for group three. So a summary of our case, we had a 26 year old who got pregnant the first time, had eclampsia in her first pregnancy, eventually had a CS done, um, had a usual postpartum care. Um, during the sit week, she was told that her BPs were still slightly high, but didn't have her BPs checked afterwards. Got pregnant the second time, presented to the ANC, BPs were checked, was told everything was fine, virtually seen by doctors, and then finally in her ninth month, she was seen by a specialist. So for us, 
our first question was, what were the challenges that we identified in the case scenario? So the first, challenge that, the first challenge that we identified was the fact that this woman was not flagged as a risk patient. So in the first place, she had eclampsia and she had a CS done. But from her booking for her second pregnancy, there was no indication of her being tagged as a risk patient. The other challenge that we saw was that the postpartum care was not optimum. We think that when the BP was still slightly raised, as it was documented, at least um, the patient should have been referred to the obstetrician for the further management or should have been referred to the intensive um, the internist for further management. We also think that when she presented for booking, BP of 113.90 was not flagged as hypertension. We realized that the midwife actually said everything was fine and we think everything was in really fine. The other thing is that we realized that there was logistically issues in the hospital. Yes, so there's the knowledge gap on the midwife's part as well. We also realized that there was no dipstick available in the, host, um, in the hospital. So logistically too, there was issues in the hospital. Um, we also think that there was um, a problem with risk communication to the patient. She should have been made aware of her condition and then the management plan if possible. And the other thing we also think was that um, she was managed by house officers throughout the ANC period and different house officers. So we think that was also a challenge that had to be seen too. And then when she presented for booking, her next review was in a month's time. We think for such a patient, the booking should have been a shorter period of time. For our second question with respect to this case scenario, um, what could have been done differently to ensure that um, Atta and her second baby survived and thrived? And with that, we said that first of all, she should have been flagged earlier as being a risk pregnancy. And then she should have been educated on her condition and then the possible management plan. We also, we also think that she should have been seen by a specialist right from the beginning when we realized her condition. And then the specialist would have decided on anti-hypertensive baseline investigations and even plan her delivery. Thank you. Yes, please. The knowledge gap with the house officers as well. Okay. <laughs> with the midwives. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Group 3. Do we have any comments from our online um, participants? <laughs> Are there any person, comments, questions, suggestions from that group yeah. in person? Any of us? I, I think uh, for the first three, one thing is running through. We are actually saying we are doing focused antenatal, but we are really not doing focused antenatal. What is happening is now there's thing that BP was checked outside and we have brought them inside one room, that's all. But what should actually go into focused antenatal is still missing because I can have different, different people coming. When I meet a client and I take a history, see, there is some connection. The same patients will not repeat everything that was said to me or to uh, wait the next time. So most of the time, we miss a lot of things during the care process. Yeah. Thank you very much. Gupti, well done. Shall Thank we invite you. four? We're actually told 10 minutes ago that we had five minutes to get back down there. But we'll do what we can. So group four, let's hear from you. Thank you. So we are members of Group 4. Our other members are back there. <laughs> yes. So we had a, a case of a woman who was pregnant with twins and was attending antenatal. And she had even gone to antenatal a day before the incident. And on that day of her visit, she had her BP reading 140, 90 millimeters of mercury. But they couldn't do a urine test because they didn't have the urine dipstick in the hospital. So she was allowed to go home. And when she went home, she developed a headache and decided to go visit her pastor for prayers. And then in the course of the prayers, she had seizures. And the pastor thought that that was the 
demons leaving her body. And so the pastor continued to pray till she calmed down. And she was eventually taken to the hospital because she couldn't, she was not responsive. So we picked a couple of things from our case study. In the hospital, so a couple of things happened with the monitoring, availability of medications, and all that. So for the first question, what were the factors that contributed to the poor outcome of this woman? We listed them under three headings, the health system factors, factors related to the health workforce itself, like the team, and then factors related to the patients, family, and community. So first of all, with the health system, we realized that there were some there were lack of some essential commodities like medications, the urine dipstick, and other things. Yes, especially the medications and the urine dipstick. And then we also realized that there could potentially be some not so good patient health worker ratios, leading to the patient not being monitored as often as she was supposed to. Even in the face of that, we felt things could have been done better. So we'll go to the health worker issues that we picked up. We realized there was delay in recognition of the problem. Because for a woman who is pregnant with twins, when with a blood pressure of 140-90, I believe that the midwives and doctors here would attest to the fact that you don't need a urine dipstick for urine protein before you even admit this woman. And she was nine months pregnant already. So this is a woman who should be admitted. And before I go, now, I go on, I'll say that this is one of the things Dr. Diganos used to preach so much at Tema General Hospital that don't allow the woman to go home. They will tell you all sorts of stories. I need to go and pack my things. I didn't prepare my home. So you have to quickly arrange something and keep them. And then we realized that there was poor prioritization because in, as part of the scenario we had, we were told that the woman was supposed to be monitored every 30 minutes, but the nurses were busy with other patients, so they were doing it too early. And so we felt there should be prioritization. We know that our labor wards are busy, our maternity wards are busy, but for somebody who has fitted and has been brought in in such a state, we should have prioritized and monitored her better. Then we also realized that the health workers did not properly communicate the risk of the woman's condition to her. Because for a woman whose BP read 140.90, if we had told her the signs of an impending eclampsia or an imminent eclampsia to include headaches, she would have quickly reported to the hospital when she had the headaches instead of going to the hospital. Then we also realized that between the health work, workers or among the team, there wasn't proper communication. Because the midwives were checking the blood pressures and were recording it and were waiting for the doctors to come and review instead of communicating to the doctors that the BPs were still high and that they should come in immediately to review and make a decision. Then when it comes to the patients and the family factors too, we realized that they had poor knowledge levels because they didn't have the right amount of education. We realized that they delayed in reporting to the facility. The woman went through fits and all of that. And we also feel like we need to carry the communication and education to the public, to the communities, to our churches, to our schools. Because if the pastor also had some information about preeclampsia, he wouldn't have been praying for the woman while she was fitting. We also felt that the anesthetist said the woman needed to wait for four hours after the last dose of max of it before they could go to theater. For those technical things, I'll allow Dr. Diganos to touch on them, but I, I don't think a proper assessment of the woman was done to make that decision. It was just like we need to wait for four hours and that is what it was. And so for the things that could have been done differently, we feel education should have been given properly during the antenatal period. You tell the woman what her risks are, especially when she came and her BP was 140.90. You need to let her know what are the things that when she sees, she should come running to you. And then we should have also involved the family in her care by telling them the things that when they see, they should bring the woman. That way, if she had told maybe the partner that I was having headaches. The partner would have rushed her to the hospital. We also feel like we need to do an earlier review. It, whether the midwife calling the doctors in or the doctors also prioritizing that this is not just 
any normal case that you review normal for early. So there should have been an earlier review. And I mentioned earlier that we need to do a lot of public education. We need to stock up medications, essential emergency medications. And we need to also improve our NHIS policy. Thank you. So we are being called to go down now. And I'm having to rush the session that I think you all agree has been fantastic. I hand over to Dr. Adiganus. Okay, I will just quickly sum up all that we've said so that we can leave in two minutes. So, when we look at all the challenges that were listed from all of your ends, we can put them into two main groups the client and the community challenges. There was a lot of ignorance, people did not understand preeclampsia. And even for BP, ordinary hypertension, you see what it is to explain to somebody who are moja bruso. At the same time, we are telling her she's anemic. In pregnancy, we, we don't know. So the terms are confusing. You, you get me? You are saying me moja no wa form. At the same time, you are telling me me wa moja bruso. So we have to rethink our counseling, our education. We have to look at dealing with these in our communities. The pastors do not understand preeclampsia. So to them, it's the demons. And I remember, I'll come to those stories. Poor care-seeking behaviors. There are so many things that feed into that. Sometimes the patients were told, but they didn't believe the story. So they didn't think they had risk. Like that woman, that's the case too. She was a multiparous woman. She felt she had had four babies, and so her, per her risk perception was very low. Financial barriers were across board. People, because of poverty, could not end. And then poor nutrition. For the teenager, malnourished, we could have dealt with the nutritional issues, even the calcium supplementation you heard about. Let's move on to the next slide. Then the health system. In these cases, we talked about access. Most of the cases came to the hospital. Remember, case three came in a taxi. If she had been brought in an ambulance, would she have survived better? So some of these delays are issue. Imagine 4 a.m. trying to get an ambulance, a, a, a taxi for somebody who is collapsed in a church. You spend at least one hour. So there are still access issues that we need to. Generally, there are issues of poor quality care, poor provider factor, uh, care provider factors. The numbers in emergency care, there is case four. The fact that the nurses were overwhelmed, were not... Um, uh, able to monitor the clients. What can we do differently in those scenarios? The knowledge, skills, and attitudes have of these care providers. There are still gaps that we need to recognize. We have issues of our data protocols, which we didn't highlight too much in this case. Lots of logistic and uh, equipment. The theater was so busy that this case had to wait a thing. Five hours, she was still there. There are infrastructure challenges. And to, if you go back, even as a country, how, how are we using data on preeclampsia to improve services? If you go to our ministries and find how many cases of preeclampsia, what have you done differently? There are data gaps there. So let me move on to some of the, uh, the way forward. Next slide, please. We need to engage, bring on board all of us. We all have a role to play. The researchers, the care providers, the professional organizations can all come together. And that's why we're all here. We're a team of people that we can push some actives. We need more intensive, more innovative approaches to educate our women and our population. What they are doing is not working. Because recently a study done in Kolebu, Kolebu in Accra, showed that about 64% of the women did not hear, know about preeclampsia. So if this is Accra, Imagine what it is out there. So there's something we need to do better. We need to use, everybody's on mobile phone today. What are we using those phones for? Women come to antenatal clinics, they are watching Nigeria movies. Could we present things better? Could we present them with movies, short clips that will talk more about preeclampsia and in the local languages? So we need to look at how we are educating clients. I talked about communities. Just to give you an example, in Tama General, I had a problem with the pastors all around Ashaman. 
One day I decided I had had enough. So I organized uh, uh, men of God and women of God for safe motherhood, and I brought them in. And we sat together with the pastors, all the spiritualists. We had a seminar, and we talked about the danger signs in pregnancy. So we need to be innovative. That's just one idea of what we can do differently. Have we considered pre-pregnancy counseling? For that woman with para four, would she have avoided even that fifth pregnancy if she knew her risk perception? So we need to consider those things. How are we going to strengthen the knowledge and skills of our care providers? Are we still going to be doing training? Today, there are all kinds of IT-based, cell-based learning approaches to continually improve knowledge and skills. So we need to go differently. We need to use the new technologies. Next slide. I'm rushing through. Please forgive me because of the time constraints. Next slide. Okay. Our protocols are out of date. Because knowledge is changing. And most of the time, if you go back to look at our protocols, they are always lagging behind. We need to find a way of making sure the protocols are up to date. New knowledge is put in those protocols and readily available. Why should every midwife not have the protocols on her mobile phone now? So that if she has a difficult case, she can refer to it and manage the case properly. We don't have to be printing books. So how do we do that? Ensuring emergency packages. I showed these slides, these pictures. I remember when I went to Tema General Hospital, getting magnesium sulfate and getting uh, things to treat patients was a nightmare. We were walking up and down. So we started with those plastic bags. We packed our emergency bags in plastic bags. Everything was there. We made a point. And then we moved to old glove boxes. And before I left, we were on plastic boxes. So we can use innovations to make sure the emergency drugs for managing complications are on site. And you can set up a system for managing and using this drug. OK, so I think that, um, let me move on to the next slide. Um, I've talked about data. Today, you heard about the audit. We have been auditing debts, but we can learn a lot from cases that were bad. So I push that to improve care at the facilities. We must continually audit what we've been doing for cases so that we can learn where the gaps are. I didn't present debts in this case. There was only one debt. But there were cases that survived, and we could have learned lessons from them to improve. And they are called yes, miss audit. So just a few ideas to improve antenatal care. I've talked about the innovative client education approaches, videos, clips. What can APEC here do to make sure small clips are available at every facility? You can even make money about from it. Pamphlets, one-page pamphlets. What is hypertension in pregnancy? I've been told I have hypertension. What does it mean? So we can do better than that. Can we improve self-monitoring? If that woman had been monitoring her, her BP at home, I do it. I tell them to go to the next clinic. There are so many pharmacy shops that will keep them. And by educating them that this BP above this level is risky, sometimes you can get better. So I've listed a few things here. I've listed how we can improve even at delivery. Um, there are some special charts which we can use that help us monitor patients better. And so I'll end here by saying that we can do better than we are doing, even amidst the constraints that we face, the economic risk. There are innovative ways we can put in place to make sure that our women do not die needlessly from hypertensive diseases of pregnancy. Thank you all for your contribution. <laughs> Sorry we didn't have much time. We could have dissected these topics better. So... Um, and we have a thank you citation we would want to present to you. Can I have some photographer? We have to run down, so please let's quickly go back into the main auditorium and 
wrap up for the day, okay? Thanks for coming, everybody.